was when I really got the very good recording was when I was mostly. We got to Mario through a patient of my father's who told us, uh, heard we were taking lessons from uh, this gentleman. And he says, why are you going to that guy for? And, uh, well, you know, he explained it was a patient of my mother's, and that's how we got into it. He says, Mario Mosty is the best around. He says, in fact, I'll take you there. This gentleman took us there. He was the nicest man. And uh, he took us to Mario's one day. We met him, and ever since then, we've, I've been with him. And, and when I heard him play, you know, the difference come from our old teacher, um, was was unbelievable. He Mario could sight read anything perfectly the first time. Like when I had lessons, I when I would hear him play on the accordion, it so inspired me that it was like I had a battery inside of me, and I would go to lessons and I would get so charged up, I'd come home practice for like two three hours. Wow. Now, Saturday. so so what you're saying is that before you met Mario, before you uh, became a student, uh, your your motivation to become an accordionist was still lukewarm? I disliked the accordion. Oh, really? We were forced into it. Oh, In fact, my In fact, my father used to put a timer on for us and make us... We had to practice a certain many hours. That was you and your sister, then? My two sisters. I oh, had okay. two older sisters who uh, took accordion lessons as well. And uh, <clears throat> it was... it was uh, I was the only one after we went tomorrow that really had the deep desire to get good because I w my sisters did it because they were forced into it. I, after we went tomorrow, was inspired by him. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. That, I guess, is uh, the sign of a good teacher when you can receive the inspiration, not just the instruction. But I guess uh, I'm fascinated with your father's uh, desire for the accordion because, of course, the accordion back uh, in, you started around 19, sort of playing? With Mario? Well, when you first started, when you first were introduced to it as an it, instrument. It'd have to be about 19. My sisters started, of course, before me, but they were my same age when they started. Maybe around 1970, 78, 79. Oh my goodness! Wow, to me it seems so recent. Uh, but <laughs> I started about 1980. Oh my goodness, that's that's incredible. So uh, it was your father's uh, love for the instrument that really prompted. Well, he him was a great lover of music. Yes. Any kind of music. There were no other accordion players in my family. Oh, I see. I'm not a, I'm not like Mario, whose father played accordion and and he was practically born with an accordion in his hands. Yes, yes. It wasn't that case for me. Right. But uh, my father always wanted to have us have music lessons. And I took piano lessons as well at the same time. I see. And with Mario, I also took button box lessons. If you're familiar with, you know, with yes, the button yes, boxes. Yes. And <clears throat> so that's interesting because in the 70s, uh, and of course by the early 80s, the accordion was regarded as a, uh, I guess, a discarded instrument for the, the general public. Most of the people uh, would not be very, um, uh, I guess you might say, would not be very proud of the fact that they, they were uh, accordion students at that time. I just wondered how you felt about that when you were well, you know, taking the lessons. Were you it, any was of your a, it was a well-guarded secret. I, okay. I didn't have any friends my age, Dan. Uh. All my <laughs> friends were Mario and <clears throat> people that I could relate to. And Dominic, uh, you've met yes, my friend yes, Dominic. Yes. And uh, and they all they all seem to be accordion players too. That's another. All interesting. accordion <laughs> players. But in high school I didn't know him, so my I had very few friends. Mario, and a few other friends who I had interest in in other areas such as woodworking. And uh, but getting back to about the uh, in school, I I told no one I played accordion I because see. that would have been a. Uh, something to be poked fun at. Right. I right. cared enough about the accordion. I didn't care what anybody thought. Not that that would discourage me from playing. It's just that I figured I don't care what they think and they don't have to know that I play accordion. I, I, uh, right. I'm I happy to know for myself that I can play but I didn't want to share it with anybody because it's a... Uh, uh, well, it's a misunderstood instrument but certainly one that uh, young people would probably, uh, as you say, ridicule only because uh, of the stereotype. Right. That, that it has, and it, it unjustly so. Just a polka but, instrument, and right. they, people don't realize the, the uh, capabilities the accordion has. Even though what Charles Bignotti has done for the instrument, it's very uh, oh, uh, unknown, very much unknown that uh, the accordion has uh, the classical capabilities, and also any type of music you can play on the accordion. It's mm -hmm. a very versatile mm -hmm. instrument. That's one of its main pluses. Sorry. And it does.
gay people and so on are all controlled by the nefarious evil jews who kind of you know have them on puppet strings and so on and this is all with the object according to neo nazis uh, of destroying sort of christian white america for the benefit of the jews well it appears at this point that a uh, white supremacist uh, according to police has walked into the holocaust center uh, museum in the His plane and to uh, interpret the pieces as he did. And I his recordings, which I have obtained through the kindness of many dear friends, my who are older, of course, such as Eddie Chavez, Stanley Brzezinski, and uh, God bless them for for uh, being able to get these recordings for me. Because when Charles Magnanti would write these songs in his his uh, you know the arrangements that were published, yes. his recorded versions were very much different. He would ad-lib and put things embellish. in there. Embellish. He had the ability to embroider and embellish around the melody. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, what I've done, I like to listen to Charles Mignotti's recordings, and I listen to what little differences he puts in, and I add that when I play them, and uh, that's why Eddie Chavez calls me the uh, uh, Charles Mignotti Jr., and he always <laughs> writes, Dear Charles, in his letters to me, oh, which I is see. a great compliment to me. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, uh, then your uh, aspirations uh, for the future, are you, are you interested in classical? You, I know you do classical on the piano. Is that, is that also one of your loves uh, well, for the future? In terms I, I love variety. Mm -hmm. And that's a quotation from Charles Mignotti. That's what they asked him in an interview. Uh -huh. And I have to say the same thing. I love to play boogie woogie, uh, classical, any, I love variety. I like to be well versed. I like to play classical as well as I play pop tunes, as well as I can play um, novelties, as well as I can play middle European, you know, e European music such as you really enjoy. I like to play a whole variety, so I'm <coughs> uh, well-rounded. Right, right. And I think right. that's important in an accordionist's uh, repertoire. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And as you grew more and more uh, involved with the instrument and the music. Uh, and your relationship with your teacher, Mario, uh, I understand that you uh, ultimately took over his business or became the new owner of what he established as a business. Is that, could you tell us a little bit about that and how you... Well, Mario, <coughs> I, I started when I was about 15 years old with uh, repairing accordions with Mario. I'd go for lessons, of course. I started with him when I was about 10, 11 years old. <clears throat> when I came to be around 15 years old, he said to me, Tommy, said, I'm not going to always be around. He says, why don't you, would you like to come down on Saturdays and, you know, if you, if you have time, and I'll teach you how to repair your accordion, and then you'll know for your own self how to repair your own accordion. I said, boy, that'd be great. I'd love to. So it started out that every Saturday when I go for a lesson, I would actually stay the whole day and uh, <clears throat> repair accordions with him. He'd train me in all the different facets. And then towards the end, this was when I was in college, I went locally to Penn State, New Kensington. I took up engineering in college, and I, I commuted and stayed at home. So during the day, when I wouldn't be in classes, there were some days I didn't even have classes, I'd be at Mario's doing the repairs, which was very nice. And I always ask, asked him if, um, if and when he would ever s retire and sell his business, if he would give me first opportunity at you know, buying his stuff. He promised me that. So one day, about three years ago, about 1997, I believe it was, the same year, in, in the springtime, about April, I was graduating that same May in engineering. He called me, said, I want to retire. And he says, you told me, you know, whenever, if I would ever retire to give you first opportunity and give you the opportunity to buy all my stuff. I want to get out of the business totally. And that's whenever I... Uh, my father actually bought it for me, which is very kind of him, and uh, got me started in the business. And um, so you've you've had an apprenticeship with Mario in the repair field as well as from from the musical instruction. And uh, correct, uh, you're pretty busy then with repairing, tuning, and, and all that sort of There's, stuff. There are not enough hours in a day to do right. what I would like to and get done. You still done. need to practice, right? Uh, and you're now taking, I understand, uh, viola as right. well. I started violin and viola late. I was about a sophomore in in uh, high school when I started. And I found out about my violin teacher through Mario also. I was always fascinated with violins, more in the construction of them, 
you know, like this famous Stradivarius violins. And one birthday, my for one of my birthdays, my father bought me a violin. And then we got the idea to get violin lessons, and we asked Mario, who was a good teacher, he referred us to Mr. Rosetti. And I took violin lessons, and then later, a few years later, he got me a viola, and I took a viola. And then as time went by, I got went in the co got to college. I got so busy, I didn't have time to practice, and I sort of left to go. Now recently, Mr. Rossetti is starting a quartet. He's 87 years old. This is, he says his last oh. venture, and since I, he says I'm one of his favorite pupils, he wanted me to be a part of it. And uh, we're working up several numbers, and uh, to, he wants to be able to play out in different places, like for retirement homes. Oh my goodness! And his nephews, wonderful. one nephew plays the cello, the other one plays the violin. Mr. Rosé on the violin, and me, of course, on the uh, viola. Viola, wonderful, wonderful. Which I, I enjoy more than even playing with, just to be with him. The, you know, the the camaraderie yes, with, because yes. uh, he's a very nice uh, prince of a man. And how does he? feel about your accordion playing? Is he, he a fan of the accordion as well? Very, used to teach accordion. Oh my goodness. That's how he met his wife actually. She was one of his students. My goodness. He was a big Magnati fan, Charles Magnati fan, and he even played in the Pittsburgh Symphony when I believe when Pavarotti came. He, he, uh, there was one time they had to play something with an accordion in it. And there was a famous accordionist that would come, you know, in the Pittsburgh area to play, but in the symphony the conductor, I believe it was Fritz Reiner, they couldn't cut it. The reason why, they could play perfectly, but they didn't know when to come in exactly on time, uh, you know, see. that it would, you know, according to the score. Yes. Since he played in the symphony for years, he was, I believe, the first violinist in the Pittsburgh Symphony from the 1930s all the way up to uh, oh my goodness. recent years. He, you know, was it was like a metronome. He knew exactly when to come in. He wa I can't say he was like the greatest of accordionists. He, he could play well. But this, the thing about him is, he he got to play in the accordion in the symphony for that one event because they, he tried out for it and they, he played in the rehearsal and he came in exactly on time when he was supposed to come in. The conductor was pleased as could be, and that's what's most important when you play in an orchestra. Yes. That you come in, and the same with as you know is with the quartet. Yes. One's late, one's early. It sounds mishy mashy. Right. That's what's so right. nice about right. Charles Magnati quartet. They were always right on sync, not one too late and one not yes, too early. It's like one, one organism. It sounds like one accordion. Then yes. And the orchestra sounds like almost one instrument, all individual instruments, but one body. Unit, yes. Unit. That's, that's very interesting, very interesting. Um, so your, uh, what, what about your, your time, the time uh, elements of, of practice uh, versus work versus you know, you have three instruments to have to rehearse and practice for, plus you have accordions to repair and tune, and of course, accordion repair and tuning is a very time-consuming process, a very laborious, tedious process. How do you manage that with your time? I mean, what, what is your day like in terms of practice? Well, How many hours a day can you, can you put into practice? I, I usually like to get up about 6.30 or 7 o'clock in the morning, and my parents get up early too, so I don't disturb them when I practice. I get up and I, you know, have my coffee and, uh, and eggs in the morning, and I like to practice about an hour uh, accordion every morning. I sit right here, I put my music out, and I practice, and then I uh, get dressed and go to the shop. And in the evenings, if I feel like it, then I'll practice maybe an hour or so. But uh, that's, uh, that seems to keep me in, in uh, good playing condition, just an hour yeah. in the morning and then a little bit in the evening. So if you, you feel that if your practice is focused and and, and, and direct it toward the elements that are most and strategic in your technique, then you can keep that level that level of playing up at, right. at, at a fine, finely tuned level without having to put in seven, six or seven hours like uh, some right. concert. Uh, well, for my concerts that will be coming up, I will practice much more because yeah, I want right. it to be perfect. Right. But um, when, I, when I found out I used to play the hand on exercises, I learned because through my piano lessons, but when I practice accordion every morning when I get up, I play numbers like Tantalizing, Accordiana, Blue Flash, the Magnati, Charles Magnati's novelties, and they're they're like exercises, the way that all the runs in them, and they keep my fingers very nimble. I see, I and see. at the same time, it's enjoyable, because a hand-on exercise is nice, but it becomes monotonous, as right. you well know. I, I find it interesting that 
Well, I find two things kind of interesting. One, that you would like the kind of music that came from an era so long before you were born, and that it seemed that a lot of the people, a lot, a lot of the young people now, and of course even people my age, find the music of the 30s and 40s and so forth somewhat uh, antiquated, and you have a real affinity for that kind of music, some of the rags, some of the, the swing music, uh, some of the music that Magnanti wrote and so forth. Uh, how did uh, what? How did you become aware of that style? Was it something your parents played a lot when you were younger? That you that you? Well, my father grew, like, grew up. He was born in 1929 and lived during World War II, and he played the numbers on the piano like uh, the White Cliffs of Dover and all the songs from World War II, and I, I liked those. But mainly through Mario, you know, I learned uh, all the older numbers and that, like those uh, novelties of Charles Mignanti's, and uh, that's how I got to really uh, like. Appreciate them. the. And, uh, yeah, it's, I've been told that I was, uh, I was born in the wrong generation. That I, I should have been born in 19, 1905 uh, or 1950, and then I could have lived through 1930 and 40, the 1930s and 40s, and, and uh, yes, sort of, yes, uh, yes. Now, you also, you also play a lot of Forsini and, and, and those, those type of numbers as well, which go back right. even further. Right, I love Forsini. Forsini wrote the most beautiful numbers for accordion. In fact, he used to say, when you play, and this is, a, this is a nice thing, I thought, a nice way of exp to say how to play music. When you play a piece of music, you should be like you're feeling a string of pearls. You have to feel each pearl, and that's how you should play a number. All the details you should... It's like when you're running your hand across yes. a string of pearls, you have to feel each pearl. That's a quotation from Frazzini. Yes, yes, that's, that's fascinating, very fascinating. And um, so you... Um, your, your, your goals for the future, what, what are your aspirations for the career that you've sort of set out before you? I mean, the, the accordion today is not what you might say the most in demand right now. How do you look at the future? How do you see the future for a, an accordionist? Well, I hope to uh, have a tape I'm coming out with called Charles Magnanti Revisited. And I hope to release that by the end of this summer. It has on it, uh, I'm releasing all of the original compositions, written rich, original compositions by Charles Mignanti for accordion, not arrangements of by other people, his original compositions. And I hope to, uh, not that I think I can make great money on it, but I, my main goal is to, to get the, get it out so people can hear that, what, what the capabilities of the accordion are, and uh, to hear yeah. Charles Mignanti's yeah. music again. And uh, I hope to make other recordings of Charles Mignanti's also in the future, you know, his arrangements and that of yeah. very nice I, I understand you've been in touch with Charles Magnanti's son, who, Correct. who has been very helpful in your, in your uh, endeavor? Yes, he, Dr. Peter Magnanti, he's a physicist, and he lives in uh, Sturbridge, Massachusetts. And in fact, he was kind enough, he invited me up later this fall. I plan on making a trip to stay at his house. He recently, his stepmother died, Charles Magnanti's, you know, wife. Uh -huh. uh, because he's the son to Charles Mignanti's first wife. and But anyway, his, his stepmother died, and he inherited all of the music, the manuscripts of Charles Mignanti's. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he wants to, he's, he's, it's a project, it's called the Charles Mignanti Collection, and it's a project that he wants to organize it. He hasn't made up yet where he's going to place it, but make it available, available to accordionists like myself. And he invited me before he even organizes it in a specific place for me to come up and look through it. Whatever I'd like to have, I could copy. Wonderful. Because there are rare, there's manuscripts there of, that Magnanti never released. Arrangements from his, I believe, his radio days and, and things that are uh, yes. worth more than gold to me. Wow. They're, they're priceless. Yes. Things that I can actually, you know, the manuscripts I can learn from it and, and play them. Wow, that's wonderful. These arrangements, that's wonderful. you know, unpublished things that are, they're uh, gems. Right, and it's good that some, people such as yourself who have an interest in preserving that kind of accordion history because yes. it's art that would be lost to the world otherwise and uh, has, a, has a real uh, real uh, value for the heritage of the accordion and for, for future and, and players. And I feel very privileged. I'm one of ten people that he, I've kept in correspondence with him since his father died off and on. And uh, I feel privileged that he wrote me a very nice letter and he asked my opinion where I think it should be placed, whether in the Library of Congress or, or uh, just a separate uh, college that they teach the accordion in. He asked my thoughts and opinions on it. Uh, I'm one of them, Charles, or 
Eddie Chavez and uh, Stanley Brzezinski or some of the other ones. Wonderful. But, but I feel very privileged to be in that select group yes, that he feels yes. that he respects our opinions on it and wants to hear our uh, well, thoughts absolutely. on it. Well, I'm looking forward to your... Uh, to the results of all these of all these efforts and activities. When I get that, yeah. it'll be shared with you. <laughs> Wonderful. Of course. Uh, the the other thing that I was wondering about, and I guess it's a technical question, uh, and I know that a lot of piano players eventually, in the old, especially in the old days, converted to accordion. When the accordion beat was very popular, a lot of people were going from piano to accordion, and of course, then when the accordion fell out of popularity, a lot of accordionists reverted back to keyboard and and piano and so forth, and uh, I guess my question is, is inter I'm interested in knowing how is it that the keys, because they're so different, the two instruments are so different in the way they're played, and the, and, and, and the, and, and the position of your fingers, the, the, the depth the keys uh, depress and so forth, the tension and all this, how does it affect your, I mean, how do you adjust to those differences when you're playing? You, you, can, you, you, play, you play the piano for several hours, you go play the accordion for an hour, how does that uh, coordinate? I mean, how do, do you have a problem with, 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 in some ways, being off when you do well, certain certain things on one instrument or the other? Or the to, to tell you the truth, Dan, playing on the piano is the best thing you could do for your accordion technique. I see. Because it's a stiffer action on a piano, and that means you have to work harder when you're playing things. Yes. And you know, during my piano lessons, I had a very fine piano teacher, and uh, she. Um, had me learn the hand-on exercises. I studied them with the metronome many times, you know, stressing each finger. And it, it stretches your head because, you know, the keys are larger. Much wider, yes. So when you come to the accordion and you play, you can just, it's so much easier because you don't have to press as hard and you're... Ah, you're uh, I see. But on a full-size accordion such as I play, the keys are very, it's, it's, it's not that much of a difference. Maybe I'd say an eighth of an inch. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's... I, I can adapt to it. You, you, you have sort of two, two uh, programs running. One of, them, two one, of them, programs. one of them goes to the accordion when right. it needs to and, and adjusts accordingly, and the other one adjusts to the piano, and doesn't, they don't seem to cross over and have a problem one way or the other then. Right. Okay. And uh, that's, I recommend anybody who is taking lessons to practice the exercises on the piano. That's one thing that uh, Charles Magnanti did. He was a uh. pianist. Uh, I'm not sure that he took lessons, but he did play the piano, and even in later years he did take advanced lessons when he was retired, I understand. He learned some classical numbers, but uh, he practiced the scales and exercises on the piano. I see. And that's the secret to uh, uh, right. gaining a very good technique. Interesting, very interesting. Now, the, the left hand, of course, uh, you don't find yourself much weaker with your left hand on the accordion. In other words, your left hand is playing so differently on the piano. Do you find yourself, like most accordion players, can play a, can play quite well on the right hand, and then if they try and do a lot of chording on the left hand, they find themselves sort of weak. You don't have that problem because you study piano from right. the beginning, so you... But I have to say that because on the left hand it's not a piano keyboard, right. the best thing for the, to, to uh, gain a uh, very good technique on the left hand is to play the scales and chromatic runs up and down on your left hand and uh, hand-on exercises on the left hand. As well, and, and, and together, probably. T together, and, and the scales in... in uh, contrary motion. Contrary motion, and I can't remember the other name, when they're together, in, un right. in unison, you know, right. in ascending, and then the left hand goes down the scales, the right hand goes up the scale, that's contrary motion. Right, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so, now, for... Uh, do you plan on teaching? Are you going to have some students? I have or? one student. Okay. It's very hard to find students. I would have, I wouldn't mind having 20 or 30 students. It's just, <laughs> it's yes. nobody wants to learn these days, it seems. You're talking about the accordion now. You, you, accordion. You, you have taught piano as well? or? I had one student, and uh, they, it was, it was a young girl in high school, not even high school, she was in grade school, and they, it was off and on, and, right. and she kind of quit. She didn't have much interest. Right. But on accordion, he's uh, my one student. He's uh, four years older than I am. That he was in went to high school with my sister, and uh, he used to incidentally take lessons from my very first teacher that told me uh, you know, that I was hard to his quotes hard to learn. He said yes. about me, <laughs> and uh, my sisters. He said that they were sassy because they would ask him questions, and any question that he didn't know how to answer, he'd say you were sassy for asking. It. I see. 
Uh, but anyway, getting, <laughs> getting back to Lou, Lou, uh, his name's Lou Galli, very dear friend of mine also, we're very good friends. He, he loves the accordion, it's so nice to see somebody my age that I can associate with. Yes, yes. I don't mind having friends that are older than me, it's just that it's nice to have friends uh, older than me, in my same age, young. I like right, to... Right, right, and that someone would also be interested in the accordion in this right. day. Right, it's so nice to, to see him uh, come for lessons that I can... He's, he's so interested and he loves to play the accordion. Right. And he's, he's starting to get very... Uh, become a very good player, I think. That Wonderful. He's lots of potential. Well, I'm sure when you share some of your uh, talent and secrets with him, I'm sure that'll, that'll go a long way to... Uh, to definitely, uh, I hope definitely that make him into it. You know, you can be a good accordionist, accordionist, but not a good teacher. Teaching is another skill. I, I hope that I can, he can benefit from what I feel that I know about the accordion. Wonderful. I, well, you uh, had a good teacher apparently because uh, I've heard you play, and my goodness. So, is Mario, um, Mario was a, was a lifelong player. Is that correct? He, he Mario played from when he was about three years old. I see. He started out as a. Uh, he was a child prodigy, actually. His, his father also played, apparently. His father played also. Joe Mosty. He he played. It started out that he he was, um, I believe, he was in a band. Every town had a band. And his father started out, I believe, on a band instrument, and then he switched to accordion. But he learned accordion in this country. He was born in Italy in the town of Massa Carrara, where the Carrara marble comes from. And he came to this country, but learned accordion in this country. I see. Didn't bring it over from Italy. I see. Interesting. And those were the early, early days of the accordion. This goes back to uh, maybe 1910, 1915. Oh my goodness. Er, maybe early, in the early 20s, Joe Mosty was a famous player. Galizzi Brothers, the famous accordion manufacturer, this is pre Excelsior. The Pancotti Brothers and Booty, which was the bella maker and the boogery reed makers, they made the Galizzi accordions. Then they all got together and says, why don't we start our own company? It's called Excelsior. And in 1924, they started Excelsior. And the very first Excelsior that was made, they, they were good friends with Joe Mosty because they made his Galizzi's. That's what he always played before Excelsior. They said, listen, you know, we know you're a famous player. Would you, if we make you an Excelsior, would you play it because, you know, promote it? He says, sure. So the first Excel chromatic Excelsior that was made was made for Joe Mosty. That's a chromatic meaning. Because he played a chromatic accordion. Oh, I see. Later on, he switched to the piano accordion, but he originally played chromatic. He even designed a special chromatic keyboard, not on that Excelsior, but on another instrument, because uh, he used to play out in the different uh, bars and different clubs. And, you know, there'd be drugs would come up when he plays accordion, and then what can you do? He, they'd play it. Oh, so I he see. designed a keyboard that was the system of notes was different from any other. They'd come up, they couldn't play a thing on it. I he see. was a very, very <laughs> in clever man. Wow, and to learn that new system would have been another uh, process in itself. But he, uh, he apparently then uh, encouraged his son, Joe, uh, or rather uh, Mario, to, uh, to play, or did Mario just automatically sort of pick it up? Mario it? loved to play, in fact, he loved to play more than to go to school. In fact, his, his father, uh, he wouldn't want to go to school, so he said to his dad, can I stay home? He says, well, if you practice it, or actually, Mario would say, if I practice the accordion all day, can I stay home from school? His father would say, yes, but you have to practice all day, and you know, and then that's it. So from the time, like say, I guess, 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the morning when school would start, he'd play until like 3.30 when the kids would get out, then he'd quit at 3.30. And instead of going to school, he'd play all day. Incredible. And that's the secret, I think, to why Mario got so good. Yeah. But he was also born with... Uh, God-given talents for music. My goodness, my goodness. Well, that's wonderful. Well, Tom, thank you very much for the uh, wonderful uh, information and the wonderful uh, uh, stories. I would like to ask you, would you wouldn't mind uh, playing a few tunes, uh, well, on the accordion and maybe a tune on the, on the piano as well, uh, just to kind pleasure. of wrap this up? be and, my uh, pleasure. Wonderful. Let's go ahead and uh, let's hear you play. Okay. Hello, uh, the first number I'm going to play is uh, Accordiana, um, written by Charles Mignotti, and uh, this particular number sold over a million copies. It was his most popular number. He wrote it when he was 19 years old, and uh, 
he wrote it when he proposed to his wife, and she said yes, and he wrote it in approximately 20 minutes. Here's my rendition of it. is uh, is uh, very popular tantalizing also an original composition by Charles Mignotti yeah. one I'll play will be a number called Blue Flash, also an original composition by Charles Magnotti. Mm -hmm. 